Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Will Rosenzweig, your course leader for Edible Education 2020. Tonight is our 13th class meeting, and it is a very auspicious date. It's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And you know that I like to um, begin our class with a, a view from the garden, but I thought tonight nothing could be more appropriate than to share this image from the Apollo 8 spacecraft that was taken in 1968. And the famous photographer Galen Rowell said that this was the most important environmental photograph of all time and that it effectively catalyzed a lot of the energy and conversation that led to the uh, formation of Earth Day 50 years ago today. So we are so delighted to be with you and um, on really a special evening uh, in the midst of both crisis and opportunity, we're delighted to have a very special guest with us tonight, not just one, but several, but our special guest, Chef Jose Andres, is here with us tonight. He has had one of the most momentous weeks I can imagine of his life. Um, he has been ubiquitous. Um, so we'll get class started right away, and I'm going to also introduce you to a couple of special guests in just a minute. This is a view from the Rose Garden, as they say around here now, you can't cancel spring. And we've got a contagion, like a breakout of roses just happening with these beautiful warm days that we've been enjoying um, here in California and Northern California. And I always try to send one of these pictures to Alice uh, during the week to kind of keep her cheered up. So. Just a little housekeeping, everything in its place. I wanted to, um, first of all, thank all of our students. You know, we have over 200 Berkeley undergrads and graduate students in this class this semester. It's our largest uh, in the last few years. And tonight we have about 100 community members joining us. And one of the things that we've been doing throughout the semester is developing the skill set of reflection and the students just have completed several reflections one about their experience with the pandemic and another we encourage them to go out into nature or visit a garden and lila and penelope and matt helen ann and um sierra all and michael all did really outstanding work and the um our teaching team wanted to especially commend you for your good work. I also wanted to remind all the undergrads that your grades have been reset to pass or no pass and that you have until May 8th to choose a letter grade should you want to do that and you have to do that on Cal Central. So that's about it for the housekeeping for tonight. I'd like to invite all of our um, participants, our students and our learning community to contribute questions in the chat tonight. We're actually using a webinar format, which is an expanded classroom that lets us accommodate the numerous people that we wanted to um, make this available to tonight. So we have several hundred ex additional people tonight. And um, so if you're in the class and you're in Zoom, you can send questions to Fiona and I, and we will field them and group them and pose them to um, our special guest. Um, and let's see, let's get started with using the chat. Now, we've been using the chat to kind of gather the collective intelligence of the class. It's a great way of seeing uh, and learning about what other people are learning. So students, now you're invited to go on the chat, please, and share a resource that you've discovered in the last couple weeks that's helping you and others stay nourished during the pandemic. So please contribute your thoughts to the chat so everybody can read them in real time. If you wanna take a look at the chat, cheese, podcasts, Bryant Terry's new cookbook, Berkeley Fire Trails, Sunshine, Costco, Bon Appetit, Zoom Yoga. We like to save these chats too and share them. They're a plethora of great ideas and resources. You can keep that coming. That's looking good. Um, I'd also like to just do a quick poll this evening. Um, 
to take attendance and then also ask you if you are interested in joining a breakout group following class tonight. We'll end right at eight, but we um, have really enjoyed small breakouts of three and four people. And we have really a fantastic collection of people online tonight. So I'd like to just take a quick poll to see who might like to, um, let's see if I can launch the poll here. So would you like to join a small breakout group after class to discuss tonight's topics? Yes or no thanks. If we get a critical mass, we'll do it. So don't feel obligated. And then students, you need to have registered with your Berkeley email tonight and also log in that you're here. This enables us to take attendance through Zoom. All right, I'm gonna just let the students finish with their attendance. And it looks like we have about 30 people or so that would like to stick around after class. So I think that's sufficient. We are going to um, go ahead and do that. And Fiona, you've got the link. So maybe at the end of class, you can share that with everyone in the 30 people or so who want to join can do that. Okay, without further ado, you know, um, today I was reading the various newspapers, the New York Times and the Washington Post and looking at the Wall Street Journal and I was trying to prepare for our conversation this evening and um, I was just maybe like you overwhelmed with the number of things that are happening related to the food system. There are just so many impacts and I thought usually when I get into a position of feeling overwhelmed by the amount of information I'm trying to organize, I try to make a little mind map. And as you can see, there's just so much happening. And our guest tonight, Jose, is really in the throes, in the thick of it all. Um, this is a highly com complex time and set of issues with a lot of wicked problems. Marshall McLuhan would have called this all at onceness, just a tremendous amount of things and that are all connected happening at once. So our question this evening is, what is possible now? And you know, we also like to reflect on kind of what's shifting in the food system. And I was just reflecting tonight that plants are closing. Um, Smithfield and Tyson have closed their largest plants, their pork plants and their chicken plants. And at the same time, um, plants are rising. There's a renaissance in home gardening. There's so much home gardening coming on now that the seed companies are actually short on supplies. The first time in decades that any of these small businesses have ever been inundated in the way they have. Well, tonight, if we were together, and we've been planning this for several years, if we were together, there would have been a lot of hugging. There would have been a lot of togetherness in the auditorium. And thanks to Alice's commitment and stewardship to this class and beyond, we're really fortunate to have Jose here tonight. And I wanted to introduce Alice to um, welcome Jose. Thank you, Will. I am so excited that Jose is here tonight. I've wanted him to come to this class since it began 10 years ago. And um, I met him really, I mean, we became friends because we did a, a yearly benefit in the coldest month of of uh, the year, uh, January, in Washington, D.C., and it was called Sips and Suppers. And we gathered in people's homes and cooked and all these chefs around Washington, and we made a lot of money for two amazing organizations that feed the homeless in Washington. And I have to say that getting to know Jose that way, I've just um, felt so 
connected. He has a kind of honesty and integrity and uh, a let's do it that, that inspires me, really inspires me. So I'm so glad you're here, Jose, and especially on Earth Day. Um, I have to say that we've been doing a project in Stockton, the Edible Schoolyard has been doing a project to feed people who are in need. And we have actually gotten 26,000 pounds of food and meats organically grown, brought into the town from local farmers who need our help right now because, of course, the restaurants aren't buying their food. And so we matched up a philanthropist with this idea and we're distributing it. But it's nothing like what you're doing, Jose. And when you landed in Oakland, I can't tell you, uh, I, you're on the front lines and I just love you dearly for inspiring us all. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Um, I'd also like to welcome Dean Ann Harrison tonight. We're collaborating with the Dean Speaker Series uh, to extend the reach of our class. Jose had originally planned to be with us in Berkeley on campus, and we were going to do a special session at Haas in the afternoon, but we decided to combine these um, efforts. So Dean Harrison, welcome. Maybe you could add a few words to the evening. Sure, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Will. Thank you so much, Alice. It's an honor and a pleasure to celebrate Earth Day with all of you, and of course, our featured speaker, Jose Andres. We are so grateful and privileged to have such a luminary in our midst, a leader who is doing such important work in the world, who's brought together his remarkable skills as a chef, restaurateur, an organizer, a humanitarian to feed the world in need. Um, I also want to say a sincere thank you for inviting our larger Haas community to participate tonight because Jose embodies a lot of the values that really guide us here at Berkeley Haas. And I'd like to focus on just one, which is beyond yourself, that really expresses so vibrantly everything that Jose does. We're really interested here at Haas in how our work as leaders can be blended and integrated in a way that works across different sectors, the private sector, the public sector, and the nonprofit sector. And Jose's leadership, his great recipes for collaboration, no pun intended, uh, certainly defy standard formulas. Tonight, we would love to have a chance to explore the full portfolio of Jose's work in all his restaurant businesses and also his nonprofit efforts at World Central Kitchen, how he brings it together and integrates his mission and actions in ways that have achieved such meaningful global impact. I should mention Berkeley plays and has always played a very special and important role in shaping the culture of food. And of course, Alice Waters has played a critical role there with the formation of Chez Panisse. And with our wonderful class, Edible Education, we are equipping our students about how to eat and lead in ways that will produce a healthier, a more just, and a regenerative food system for all. Now, more than ever, we need these efforts and we really need leaders like Jose Andres. So I'm really looking forward to what we'll learn tonight, and I know all of you are too. Back to you, Will. Thank you, Anne. Thanks for being here. Thanks for expanding our community tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jose to join me. Um, Jose, you must be exhausted. I've never seen a man in more places at once. I think this week from Sunday night on 60 Minutes to the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Medium, I've just been overwhelmed with how 
present you are. And um, what I thought we would do tonight is really try to use the framework of the class that we've shaped. This is a class really about how to be a food systems change maker. And um, I wanted to just share the framework of the class as a way to guide our conversation. We started the semester talking about values and how values for people who are making change inform choices, behaviors, actions, and ultimately mission. We've also been talking about systems and developing food systems intelligence, looking at flows and connections, interdependencies, power structures, and of course, leverage points. And I think you appear to me as someone that is a master at identifying leverage points in the system and also connecting in very resourceful ways different parts of the system that are not necessarily always connected. And then finally, we've been talking a lot about entrepreneurial agency and action this semester. We've been talking about the pragmatic imagination, sort of how to be bold in our vision, but also pragmatic and practical in our execution. And we've been practicing entrepreneurial mindsets that really revolve around the bias for action and the opportunity to coordinate disparate participants or actors in a, in a collaborative and coordinated way. So I can't think of anybody that is more mm -hmm. qualified and appropriate. And, and I was looking at your website and there behold on your website is the mission statement, change the world through the power of food, which may as well be a mission statement for this class. So here is uh, just to share with our audience, I thought this would be a great place to start to have you talk about your own mission and the core values of your organizations that, that guide you. So welcome, Jose. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for, for um, the, the kind of introduction by all of you. And um, you know, about Alice Waters, uh, what can I say? Um, she's been a force of nature for me, uh, a woman I followed before even I met her through her very simple, clear ideas about how food systems and, and business can, can are one and, and we can have profitable business taking care of the, of the network of farmers and fishermen and everybody that makes food possible and have successful restaurants that they are part of the community but understanding that the restaurant is only one more part. So um, Alice has been uh, an amazing friend. I cannot believe now I can say she's my friend. And she's been for me really this kind of amazing um, person to follow and help her to keep moving her dream forward. I still remember that nobody in the world will um, be able to convince uh, Washington DC and the national parks to be able to do a farm in the middle of the mall between uh, Congress and George Washington Monument. Uh, she made it happen and she was able to bring there every single senator and congressman that was probably not smart enough to answer her phone call. And uh, in the moment she got uh, with them on the phone, everybody show up there. Uh, and this only shows you uh, the determination that this woman has to put foot front and forward in the meaning of America and the meaning of we the people. So. So, you know, I arrived this country very young. I was 21, 22, I was in the Spanish Navy. And I've been always um, very blessed of being part of uh, this country. Um, and, and I know where I come from, I'm a Spaniard. I know where I belong, I'm American. And as a, an immigrant gives me a very good understanding that what is good for one country must be good for the other that this moment we are living in life, we understand that we can be talking about building walls, but this is not about that. This is about shorter walls and longer tables. And this is what very much Alice has stood for all her life. Um, so my company, um, which is not my company, is the company of everybody that decides to work with us. People have a tendency to say that they work for me. They don't work for me, they work with me. 
they are part of the good decisions and on the not so good decisions. Uh, I think it was Winston Churchill that said that success is going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. A lot of people put my company and sometimes me as an example of success. And I can tell you that I can, tell, I can give you so many moments of failures that uh, I, I will not stop for hours. But enthusiasm probably something like always carrying myself, my, my friends, my partners, and all the people working with us. So what you described there about what, what uh, uh, Thinfood Group, my, my for-profit company stands for, this is very old. We said that we want to change the world through the power of food. A few restaurants. How can we change the world through the power of food? But we, we realized that one restaurant at a time, we could make that happen. Um, in a moment that I wanted to open a fast food restaurant or quick serve restaurant, and my partners, everybody was thinking, let's open another burger place or, or a hot dog place, or um, I wanted to open a vegetable place. Why? Because I felt like if America was craving for something, and America was not able to get it, was vegetables. So we opened this concept called beefsteak, that if it succeeds, everybody will tell me that I am brilliant putting names, but if it fails, everybody will tell me I'm a fool because who will call a vegetable restaurant beefsteak? Um, but it's a place where we celebrate vegetables and you can get a bowl for six, seven, eight dollars. And, and, and this is what changing the world through the power of food meant, that you don't give a speech because it looks good at the moment, but this is something like it's very deep in your DNA and you stand for, even if at times it's not the most logical business decision. Uh, there are not good business decisions or bad business decisions. There are decisions that you believe in that will make your business successful. Um, there's many bad ideas out there that, that if you have a, a, a guy that really believes in them, you will go through, you will adapt them, you will make them better, and eventually you will be leading the way. Uh, no any different than the guy that had the brilliant idea to put a camera on the phones and some photo company making photo rolls, mm -hmm. told them that's a very bad idea. Who will want to take a photo with their phone? Well, <laughs> that guy persevered and today we, we are nothing without our camera on the phone. I don't know what is more important, if the camera or the phone. So anyway, uh, I don't wanna keep going and rambling, but, but my company believes in these basic principles. Uh, when uh, we were one of the first companies that we shut down uh, our restaurants. I knew that this was going to be bad. I was following this coronavirus from China early on. It's something I'm passionate about uh, in this crisis to understand what happens with food. And I was following this very closely. So we were uh, watching um, and, and for me it was obvious that America was going to be hit, that Europe was going to be hit and, and happen. Um, 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 when I announced that we were closing, I did it to protect my teams, to protect the guests, and, uh, and to be part of the solution, not be part, not be part um, uh, of, of, of the problem. And we were able to stop the restaurant and transform them into community kitchens immediately. So I was able to go from business to an emergency business. And we call them community kitchens, knowing that restaurants like mine and restaurants across the world we will have to change our mentality in this moment. We will have to go to giving pleasure, to giving emergency food to many people in need. So I do believe that uh, in business today, uh, everybody's gonna be telling you that you have to plan, that you will have to do a business plan. Yeah, for certain things you need it. You need to prove it to your investors, you need to prove it to your bank, so you get a loan. But I'm gonna be telling you in this 21st century, Planning is something of the past. The new word is adaptation. If as business people, that's a matter we are in the for-profit or non-profit world. And me, I carry almost like two hats. Adaptation is gonna be key. Why? 
Because if anything, this virus is showing us one simple thing. It doesn't matter how much you plan, all those plans are going garbage because you couldn't plan for what has happened. It was impossible to plan. So adapting to the circumstances, not complaining of what's going on, but actually seeing in the moment of today an opportunity to be part of the future. That's what I do in my private business. That's what I do in my nonprofit business. And I don't know if it works, but that's what I believe in, that adapting to the situation will always be much more powerful than spending hours or days or weeks or months planning for what you cannot foresee. One of the things that really struck me when I was um, reading this book that you produced um, that really tells the story of how you and your colleagues responded to Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico is the uh, acknowledgements. I, I was struck that in the back of the book, the acknowledgements go on for about 10 pages. And the people who you acknowledge are from every facet of the system, if you will. There's chefs, there are other business people, there's people in distribution, there's people in government, there's, there are uh, people in philanthropy. There, I mean, it's just like all of these people who normally don't talk to each other somehow come to the call behind a shared vision. And I'm just really, maybe you could talk a little bit about what the power of a network is and how does it come to be? I mean, how, I mean, everyone recognizes you today, but when you were young and before you, you had the recognition in the platform, how is it that you are able to create this cohesive, collaborative, committed network of different people to, to come to the call? Um, huh. uh, I, you know, if I tell you the truth, sometimes I, I, I look myself in the mirror again and, and I say, man, what a failure today. Because many things I planned for or I dream of didn't happen. Mm. But what I know is that I keep knocking on the door. And I've done this all my life. When the door doesn't open, I knock on the window. And if the door, the window doesn't open, I wait on the door until that door opens. Uh, I do believe that's very important. Persistence is very important. Uh, an idea that you don't keep going at it is not really an idea that probably was any good. You, when you have an idea that you think is worth fighting for, don't give up, never, don't give up. Because if you're gonna be stopped by no's and by failures, no idea will ever come to life. So for me, um, I believe uh, that, that I fight for those ideas I, I believe are worth fighting for. Uh, in the book you are talking about, uh, I feel very guilty because even in that photo in the front of the book that I'm cooking, that was one of the few times actually I cooked. I will serve food, I will deliver food, I will make sure that the system will work. I will be on my phone, on text, on WhatsApp, on email, and on the phone calling everybody and organizing everybody. And I will go around the island sometimes, at least uh, once a day, I will be able to go to every corner of the island. Um, I realized that what happened in Puerto Rico is very much what's happening right now with this coronavirus. And we've been in some situations before that we had to take care of an entire island like Puerto Rico. It's not like we fed everybody in Puerto Rico, but we did 4 million meals and we were able to do over 100,000 meals a day for many days when the entire island was destroyed. I didn't do it. We, the people, did it. The people of Puerto Rico fed Puerto Rico. The only thing we did, the only thing I did was planting the seed that was possible. I remember in the first weekend after the Hurricane Maria, I was able to bring on a Sunday at 9 p.m. to the hotel I was staying after coming back from the south of the island and realizing that the problem was even 
exponentially bigger than what we were able to see on TV or hear on the radio, that they call all the people that were the food producers and distributors in Puerto Rico. And they all came and I told them one very simple thing. This island is hungry, but all of us here, we can feed this island. The only thing I, I need from you is to adapt to everything is gonna be happening. We're gonna need trays to deliver the food. We're gonna need cameras to get the food hot. We're gonna need uh, refrigerator trucks. I wanna be priority every time we place an order for food. We're gonna need things that we don't even know today, we need them. I need all of you to make it happen. I didn't make it happen, they made it happen. Uh, we needed help on Congress and somehow in the White House to make sure that FEMA, which has great people, but great people with a lot of red tape that then seems nothing happens and where emergency is not something really they understand. They understand uh, management, but they don't really understand emergency per se, because when it's about food and water, emergency means today, you cannot be talking about how to feed people next week or next month. The urgency of now is now. So what we see right now in America is that we have a health crisis. We have an economic crisis that is created because I don't believe the right decision has been made. I think we were supposed to put everything like in a long hibernation, like a long Thanksgiving. Like instead of a, a four long days of Thanksgiving with the weekend, just make it a few weeks and make sure that everybody use, goes down like a, like a long sleep and take care of the health crisis first. But what nobody's talking about is about the humanitarian crisis. That's why many weeks ago I began saying, we have a humanitarian crisis. And we began getting ready to make sure that food will not be part of the problem, but part of the solution. And for that to happen, many things have to work at once. If we put money on the food banks, it's not enough because the food banks are overwhelmed. If we don't support the food banks with volunteers, it's not gonna happen because the food banks are overwhelmed. Doing a great job, but overwhelmed. Supermarkets are overwhelmed. Even the big distribution companies like Amazon and others are overwhelmed. Um, all of the sudden farmers don't have restaurants to sell and they're throwing food uh, uh, to these uh, fields and everybody is feeling desperate because it's like hungry people in places around America and farmers throwing away the goodness of the earth in other part. How is this possible? At the end is one word and every person is watching us and is on business, remember this one word, distribution. If we are able to distribute goodness and empathy, the world is a better place. If we are able to spread uh, knowledge and information, the world is wiser. If we are able to distribute anything we need to share with others, the world is better. When it's about food and water, if we have the water and the food, but we don't have systems to quick distribution from the places that we have to the places we don't have, we have an emergency in real time. And that's what's happening right now. If we are able to solve the distribution problems that America and the world faces right now, food don't, will not be wasted. Farmers in rural America will actually do better even in a moment of emergency. Food will get to the places that people are in need of. The systems will keep functioning in this emergency until the health crisis goes away and things began looking normal. Distribution is what is failing most of the time in emergencies. Mm -hmm. In this moment, it's not any different. Mm -hmm. Well, that description you just made is the quintessential um, expression of the pragmatic imagination we've been talking about because you're sharing a vision and then you're talking specifically about how and what needs to be done to implement it. And I'm also really struck, we've been observing this semester, we've had a lot of people who are change makers and one of the things they have in common is that they show up persistently and I think um, I hope would Jose would you let me show a brief film that Satchel sent me that um, 
shows what happened when you just landed here a couple of weeks ago in Oakland, because I think it kind of tells the story in Please. a way. Let me, um, let me share your hands. with everyone, and it will give you a moment to sip your beverage too, as we um, carry on. I'll just try to share my screen and here we go. Well, Friday uh, last week, Jose called me and said, I need your help. We need a kitchen and we got to feed these people, 3,500 people uh, on the Princess cruise ship that are quarantined. That's an opportunity to start to help. What are you talking about? Thank you for the opportunity to work with you. We had people from all over the San Francisco Bay Area, not only the Bonapit chefs and uh, volunteers and our managers, but a number of other people in the community that also helped us. We just love being on a boat stuck for 14 days, you lose some control of what's going on in your life. You know, again, that's a stressful situation. So alleviating the stress of the people on the boat, we're still cooking the same meals. We're still making the amazing food. The people in the end are the most important part. A home cooked meal of some food that they know and love is, is important for that recovery mentally. Coronavirus is gonna be hitting hard. We're going to have to adapt and open kitchens to be able to provide meals to those people that will need a plate of food. So, World Central Kitchen is going to be activating in the next two or three days a protocol to partners. Uh, World Central Kitchen, we cannot be everywhere, but yes, we believe we can be helping coordinate all the people, private sector, other NGOs that will be, I know, already feeding uh, community. So please follow us at World Central Kitchen. We'll hear more about how to participate, how to partner. Some of the biggest problems, they have easy solutions. Use one plate of food at a time. This is the beginning of a better tomorrow. I really enjoyed seeing that. I know that when you got, when you arrived in California, you were working 20 plus hour days and you actually, I remember, sat down with some of our former students at Berkeley, Kristen Richmond and Kirsten Toby from Revolution Foods, who actually started Revolution Foods in a class at Berkeley 12 years ago, um, inspired by a lot of the people that have come through our class at Edible Ed over the years. So it's just amazing to see how you've connected so many different people. Yeah. Actually, in this moment, I, I went to Revolution. Uh, mm. We, uh, the teams you saw there, they are, they are my brothers. They are men and women that they've been everywhere in the last few years. Um, Bahamas, we did three and a half million meals. 14 islands, almost 75,000 meals a day, less than five days. We stayed there for weeks. We were the first ones to arrive. Uh, 10 days before any of the big NGOs, UN, USAID even arrived. Um, I was very proud of them. When Yokohama happened, when the Princess cruise ship in Yokohama was the first big cruise ship that was hit by Corona, uh, the same man and woman you see there in Auckland went to Japan. So we've been fighting Corona now forever. As you see in that message, I'm very surprised because already there I'm calling out that this is an emergency. Mm -hmm. that we need to get ready. Mm -hmm. And I said that we cannot be everywhere because we are a small organization. We have only 45 people. Even we've shown that we grow exponentially when we have to. In Puerto Rico, we had more than 25,000 volunteers. In Bahamas, 5,000. In a country of 450,000. So this shows you really that the men and women of Paul Central Kitchen, we are very quick in adapting to the situation. So as soon as I left San Francisco and I arrived in DC, we already had the system in place because we knew this was going to get very, very bad. And I think because we were ahead, is why we were able to give away to the hospitals thousands of N95 masks. Mm -hmm. Why a group of cooks will have N95 masks? Mm -hmm. Why we will be able to go to hospitals that had none and be able to give them masks? because we were already preparing for what was coming. Mm -hmm. We ordered the mask for ourselves to protect our teams. I never imagined that our hospitals will not have enough to take care of the, 
nurses and doctors. So right now we are in more than probably 100 cities. We are in, I don't know, 20 plus states. We're in Spain, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. Uh, I think we are already doing close to 250,000 meals a day. We are feeding elderly. We are feeding homeless. Uh, we are feeding uh, school systems, giving them support. We are helping with ideas with uh, Feeding America Food Banks, which I think they're doing an amazing work, quite frankly. Uh, we are covering the blind spots of the system. At the same time, we're doing a lot of work behind, talking to senators and congressmen, telling them until Congress and the White House doesn't recognize this is a humanitarian crisis, <laughs> they're not gonna put the effort and the resources to take care of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so what we did was what we always do, um, partner with people. We are an NGO, people believe in us, they support us with money, and we put that money at the service of the people. We have, we open arenas here in DC at the Nationals. Last year, a few months ago, I was throwing the first pitch on the World Series, and now I'm cooking in the same stadium to feed more than 10,000 people a day in DC. Today, I came back from Baltimore, where we are partnering with the school district of Baltimore to cover the many areas that they need some support, uh, especially in the low income areas. Uh, tomorrow, I may be going to Charlottesville in Virginia to see the operation we have there. We're in Oakland, we're in Newark, we are in Harlem with my, uh, uh, um, uh, with, with many of my, my good fellow chefs. We, um, we, ha we, we have in our network more than 500 restaurants across America, very strategically located in places is need. So we support them and they, in, in, they support feeding hospitals and the shelters and giving support to the local mayors. So what we do is that, uh, bring everybody to the table. Mm. Uh, a problem will always keep being a problem if you don't take a 360 degree approach. For our private business, if you don't tackle the problem from 360, that problem will never go away. In the nonprofit, if you don't tackle the problem from 360, that problem will never go away. But I do believe in this moment, we have an amazing chance if we are persistent and we do things right to get out of this crisis, understanding what America needs to make sure that food will never ever be the problem again, mm. but that food will be the opportunity. Why we keep talking about food deserts? Why we keep talking about food deserts? Why the USDA with private sector enterprise the local mayors and the governors don't put a market in every area there is a food desert. It's a very simple enterprise. Make sure that those people, we don't feel pity for them, sending them to be online in a food bank. Why we don't use snaps and markets in those food desert areas so families can go to shop and if they wanna buy something, they pay. And if not, they can use snaps. In the process, we help our farmers. In the process, we bring uh, pride to those neighborhoods. In the process, we bring a stability to those neighborhoods. Should not be more food deserts anymore in America out of this crisis. Why? Because if we will have those markets in every low income area, in those areas that need us to show up, food distribution is already created. Bring the food there twice a week, Families will have near their homes a place they can rely on food arriving every single week. All of a sudden, we don't need to see long lines in the food banks of America. You see very big problems. They have very simple solutions. My role the next 25, 30 years of my life will be to make my company, private company successful and whatever extra time I have, making sure that we bring ideas, that they are not only ideas we bring by mouth, but the ideas we bring forward with examples. Today was Central Kitchen, I can tell you, I saw the tweets. We've been in places like Corona Queens and Brooklyn and Bronx, bringing vegetables of farmers that they cannot sell. And on top of the hot meals we bring, we bring trucks loaded with fresh vegetables. And we are distributing those fresh vegetables in the communities. You see, I wish I could be in every single city doing that, 
but by us doing it in many cities, we show examples of what we must do to make sure that food again is not a problem, but food becomes part of the solution. We're really intrigued by this interface between the for-profit business and the non-profit. Um, and I understand that you operate them in completely independently with different teams, but it does create kind of a laboratory for you to, to try out new things very quickly. And I read about one of your latest innovations this week where you're using World Central Kitchen to actually employ uh, restaurants and chefs and cooks to prepare meals in light of the crisis. And then you're also getting involved in the insurance and uh, a regulatory conversation about who's getting money in this, in this uh, time. Uh, can you talk more about that? I'm intrigued with that. Well, it's all of the above. Um, myself in my in the restaurants, we directly own a Tim Food Group. We have 1,600 employees, and we were able to support them um, all the way almost to the end of April. Uh, five, six full weeks, full benefits, full salary, um, um, and I'm very proud that we were able to do this. This gave uh, I know uh, all the team members of my company, the possibility to go through this crisis uh, together, preparing. I only request from them one thing. Who wants to volunteer in the restaurants, we cannot take anybody, you can come. But if not, you must stay home. Because for me, it's very important everybody goes through this as healthy as healthy we can be. So for me, this was very important. And obviously, um, it's being held from the government for small businesses, the idea was good on paper is uh, the famous uh, and the, the three P's, the, 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 the bill that uh, is supposed to be helping restaurants and the small businesses. But then we learn that it's helping also very big businesses and, and, and the idea was good, but the implementation of the idea has been so, so as we speak right now is many great people. Um, we are talking uh, is this independent restaurant coalition of many small restaurant chefs, owners like me, that we are, even myself, I have many restaurants and in many ways I'm not considered as small, but every one of my restaurants is small and I have different partners and, 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 and they're part of one community. And, and we believe that restaurants are such a good way for the government to be helping the restart of the economy. Why? It's not any other business but a restaurant that Every dollar you spend as a guest tickles down into the economy all around. When you come to a restaurant, you spend a dollar. Yes, you're paying for the, everybody that works there, cooks and waiters. But you're paying, obviously, helping pay for the electricity and for the lease. So the landlord benefits and he can pay his loans back to the bank. But then we need to be higher in the marketing and the PR internal and external, and then the architects and the decorators, and, and then the guys that sells us the new chairs every five or 10 years, and then the farmers and the fishermen, and then uh, you keep going, and every dollar, more than 90% of that dollar goes into the community. So to support the second biggest employer in the country, the second biggest industry technically in the country, every dollar that is going to come to restaurants is going to help enrich and lift up the entire economy. That's why it's so important that Congress in this coming fourth bill will support not only small business, but restaurant business, because we are over seven, 800,000 businesses across America. We are in every corner of America. And I do believe that our society today, restaurants are part of the DNA and everything they bring around. So I do believe that that's gonna be very important. That's why I put time, my time to be speaking to senators and congressmen, sometimes in the back, sometimes in the front, and supporting the different people that they are doing this day and night, like Tom Colicchio and others who are doing very good job being the voice and representing uh, many of the restaurants across America. Uh, so on, on, on one part, obviously, that's, mm -hmm. that's for me, uh, is, is, is very important. As we are talking about that, nobody's talking about 
how the restaurants are going to be looking tomorrow. Yeah. Are we going to be able to open with the same tables, the same number of chairs? The answer is probably no in the short term. But how the restaurants are going to look like? Are we going to have to have uh, acrylic panels between people? If we, you watch what's happening in, in China, maybe that's what we're going to have to do. Do you want to go to a restaurant if you have to be like Camus with a screen in between? Um, so the near future doesn't look too good. But then I go back to history and you read what happened in 1918 and, and 1919 with the Spanish flu, badly called the Spanish flu, but nonetheless the Spanish flu. And what we learn is that the economy eventually is going to come back. Normal life is going to come back. Uh, this is what we learned from 100 plus years ago pandemic. But again, this coronavirus may be worse. So we don't know. We need to adapt and we need to plan. My mission is to prepare for the worst, but uh, hope for the best. If things go better quicker, we need to be ready to fly. You have no one second to waste. But if things go worse than planned, we need to be there to adapt to whatever circumstance we're going to be living in. Yeah, one of the things that comes up frequently in my conversations with students and during office hours is we frequently um, come to the topic of the importance of a mentor, particularly for people that um, have an ambition to make their mark on the world, to make a difference, to be a food systems change maker. And I know that you've had some really important mentors. And um, as I was reading your book, I was hoping you would share a little bit about your experience with um, your special mentor and maybe some advice for the students about how to engage a mentor, how to find a mentor, how do you develop a mentor relationship, um, particularly in this time when there's going to be so much uncertainty in the, our pathways in the job market and, and the future. Um, I'm 50 and, and I, have, I guess that many of the people are watching us probably are younger than me and when I was much younger, I thought that I knew everything and I didn't need anybody. Even I left school when I was very much 14, 15. I went to culinary school, but I didn't graduate until I was 46. And they only gave me my title only because they wanted some PR to bring new students to the school, I think. I fell on English, accounting and cooking. So imagine my, my, my success, but, but I realized that many of the people we have around us right now, sometimes we take for granted and we don't even give a lot of importance. Years from now, we're going to remember certain things they told us or things we saw they did. Actually, those moments were more important in our, short, in our lives than we ever recognize. My father will never let me do the fire, uh, never let me do the cooking, only the fire. One day I got upset. He threw me away. He got me on the side and told me, my son, I know you wanted to do, do the cooking, but the most important is to do the fire. Learn to control the fire and then you'll be a cook. Then you'll be able to do any cooking you want with your life, literally and metaphorically. That was my important lesson. I didn't give it importance when he told me. Um, and many moments like this in my life, I do believe that uh, in my recent life, I was very blessed with the people that hired me. Rob Wilder, my friend, my partner, Roberto Alvarez, the guys that brought me to um, Washington, D.C. I came as a young cook, a young chef. I barely knew how to even um, run a kitchen, but there I was. Uh, I had this uh, executive chef in my early days as I had chef uh, Haleo. Could because you will always get so much more back from them. No, 
not only because it's the right, uh, the, the right thing to do in terms of maximizing their potential, but because it's the right thing, human thing to do, but business-wise, better you treat people, more you get out of them. It's, it's, just, it's just not not only the right thing, business thing to do, it's obviously the right moral human thing to do, but actually the right human thing to do is the best business decision. Why would not do more of those things, right? I think in the in the hunger movement and, and the power of food movement, Robert Egger, who told me um, that charity seems is about the redemption of the giver when charity should be about the liberation of the receiver. You can apply this to your private business or for your nonprofit business. Are you here to redeem yourself of something? Or are you here to liberate somebody from something? Or in this case, to empower somebody. If every single business today, we're gonna to be empowering the people that are part of that business, our communities are gonna be much better. Um, to me, it's very amazing that right now we have people working in two, three jobs that they still need to go to the food bank. We should be in the business of closing food banks and we should be in the business of closing NGOs like mine. Why we have food banks? If we pay people well, actually it's good for everybody. They don't need to go there to wait online for food. They can afford to buy their own food. In exchange, the economy does better. In exchange, our communities do better. In exchange, everybody feel proud of who they are and their standing in the community. That should be the right business. On the other hand, we are all talking about minimum wage, when we should be calling, not minimum wage, but the right wage, the, not, not even the living wage. We should call it the rich wage. Because if everybody does well, everybody spends more money, the economy does better. I mean, it's such a simple um, idea, but then we don't do it. Because everything is about the bottom line. Everything is about that number. Everything is about the EBITDA and everything is about how much money you pay back to your investors. Um, when, when sometimes maybe that's the wrong approach to it. Because if we have people right now that they're hungry, why do you wanna do well as a business? when across from your business, you have people waiting in line to get a plate of food. I rather prefer to do okay, but make sure that nobody's online on a, on a community kitchen waiting for a plate of food. So anyway, uh, those are ramblings about many lessons learned, but they do believe everybody has to be their own mentor to a degree. Uh, you need to listen to your inner self. Mm. It's going to be a lot of people telling you what your life should be like. And you should write your own recipe of success. And if everything was so well done and everything functions so perfectly, well, um, it's not the case. We have a lot of things to improve, a lot of opportunities, a lot of things to make better. It's an opportunity for everybody to be part of that better tomorrow. And you can do it on the private sector covering needs that right now is not happening. And you can do it in the nonprofit sector. And at the end, we understand that everything is one. Uh, I do believe the new American dream is that what must be good for you and your family and the people you know, must be good for the people you don't know. Mm. Cannot be anymore I the person, me, me, me. Has to be with the people. And this is not a new idea. This is an old idea. This is the beginning of our country. <laughs> so let's all believe in we the people and understanding that we are only as good as the people we have around us. That we are only as successful as the success we have around us. Every time a new restaurant opens in my street in Washington DC for the last 26 years, at the beginning, my lunch business went down. My dinner business went down. But a few weeks later, my business went up. The new business was successful. My business was doing more. We were all achieving the same success. That's the new mentality we all need to be living in. Cannot be how well I'm doing, but has to be, are we all enjoying the goodness of the earth? Are we all enjoying this wealth that seems is surrounding us? If the answer is no, we must do better. Because at the end, if we look for the success of others, at the end, really what we're doing is investing in our own success. A perfect message for Earth Day. Thank you. I'm going to um, invite 
Fiona to share some of the questions that the students have posed to you. And we'll keep you just a little bit longer tonight. I know it. It's been a, been a very- My wife long. is here with me listening to a, oh, good. my ramblings, my daughter, so it's good. good. Family's there with you. They can come on the screen too, if they like, so. There's, my, my, my daughter is enjoying this class enormously. She's an NYU, but she's, uh, I mean, uh, yeah. I see her taking We, we, we want to open a chapter of edible education at every school, so maybe she can be the ambassador to uh, NYU. We would like that. So Fiona, can you come back on with yes. your, your video and your voice? And Yeah, so I am my, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, yes. I'm unable to turn my own video on, so if Dana's able to turn my video on, that would be great. Um, so, Jose, oh, here we go. Start my video. Hi there. Hi, Fiona. Um, so, first of all, we have questions from Charlene and Karina, two students in the class, who are wondering if you have advice on what students can do to follow in your footsteps and a little bit more specifically get involved in the particular work you're doing right now with World Club Field Kitchen. So the, the first piece of advice I'm going to give them, don't follow my footsteps. <laughs> because I want to follow their footsteps. Um, and I don't say that because it's probably the right thing to say and everybody will say, okay, great answer. Um, if I did everything everybody before me told me to do, I don't think I will be where I am. Because what's happening is that all of us, we are our own unique universe in our own way. And we all have this powerful opportunity to contribute. Sometimes by being followers, very often in my life, I'm just a follower. Sometimes in the moments we believe is the right moment for us to be the leaders. And it takes a balance. Great leaders can be great followers. They must be great followers. So it's so many opportunities out there. It's so many paths that we can all be taking. Used to think like, because we've been on this planet for thousands of years, used to think like nothing can be changed and nothing can be uh, reinvented. Is used not true? If not, take a look, look back at history. So my, my, my thing will be, be you, be yourself. Actually challenge everything. Actually challenge everything they're teaching you. Challenge everything they've told you. Because by challenging, you're finding your own truths. If not, you are just playing with the truth of somebody else before you decide they were the universal truths. It's certain things that they are constant in life. But many other things is up to you to decide how what are you doing with those things. So don't follow the footsteps of anybody. Just join people that you may feel can inspire you. And if you join somebody that doesn't inspire you, still is something to be learned from. And I will say something too, just be near people that disagree with you. Stop being those seals on the zoo that they start clapping when they're fed sardines. Stop going to the same places where everybody agrees with you. And when somebody says a big truth, everybody claps without hesitation and without questioning if what they are clapping, they're clapping because the person next to them was clapping or what. Go to the places that people don't think like you and actually as the opposite of you as you could be. Because you must enjoy it those different points of view. Try to be humble in the understanding that maybe they may have a point on certain things that you totally disagree with. And thinking that those people don't think like you is what is enriching you, is what is making you better. Well, by learning new things, or well, by reaffirmation of your own beliefs. But move away from the people that actually clap at you or think like you. Let yourself be challenged. And don't follow the footsteps of anybody. You can create the way by walking, foot on the ground. One step at a time, you are going to be creating your own path. Simple as that. Thank you. And so somewhat related to that in terms of your own path, were there any, this is a question from Joanna, 
Um, were there any aha moments in your childhood where you just knew that food was going to be your career? Mm. I mean, I think I think my my love with food was, um, you know, was something that was there, was building over. We need to remember that the love for food we have is um, one of the first moments that we feel we are loved is when we are fed in the moment we come out of the bomb of our mother. Well, by she feeding us or by our father giving us the baby bottle, that first moment of somebody feeding us is something we don't remember. It's something we're highly unconscious, something I wish we remember because probably it will be a very beautiful moment, maybe. But I do believe that, that that moment with food, that relationship many of us we have um, begins in that first moment we are fed and forever stays with us. But for me, I think um, uh, <laughs> that it's been slowly, I was passionate from the beginning. And, and I remember making first cakes and the first time I make madeleines and the first time I born myself making caramel for the flan that my mother was making. And, and I remember working in a restaurant and I had this tray of cannelloni with bechamel, which actually people think are Italian, but in Catalonia, Barcelona, we make the best ones, sorry, Italy. And I came out into this restaurant. I was working in summer, I was 16. And I had this long tray and it's these doors in the kitchen separating from their dining room that go in and out. And as I was leaving the kitchen, one of the doors hit the back of the long tray I was carrying, very hot. And the tray began slipping from my hands and ended in the very big fish pond aquarium with all the live fish in this fish restaurant that the entire, all the fish began jumping, eating the meat cannelloni and the entire water became milky and cloudy and I look like a fool in front of an entire dining room. If in that moment I didn't quit cooking, I knew that I will never uh, uh, quit cooking. So I can tell you great moments of successes, but probably if I survive a moment like that, and I'm even able to tell it to you, um, that tells you that even out of those very bad moments that every one of you is gonna experience, one way or another, uh, remember that enthusiasm will carry the day and, and that um, is gonna be many moments. Um, but then is one moment. I was seven, my father took me to this rural town, an uncle of mine I never met, in very rural, rural, like almost like a movie rural, uh, seven, uh, 1970s town, almost no electric light, candles in the home. And we arrived late and he was cooking there in an open fire in a very big metal um, uh, pot. And he had all bread, all bread, very old bread, almost moldy. And he was cutting it with very old knife. And he had some rancy pork fat. And he put the pork fat in the pot. He had the old bread with some sprinkled water with his fingers, so it got humid. And after the fat melted, he will add the bread, a garlic clove, one, one clove of garlic, and he will be cooking that bread until the bread was nice and toasty and crunchy, but soft with the smell of the pork and the fire and the garlic. He put the bread once was ready in the plate. He made two fried eggs right there on the fire. And we ate all bread crumbs with two humble fried eggs. Maybe that was a moment of truth in my life of understanding if all bread, moldy bread, could be so glorious in mind what you can do with the amazing goodness of the earth. Yeah, the compelling experience and memory. Um, so one more question kind of about your particular path and works on them. We'll talk a bit more about COVID and Central Kitchen, but um, 
Someone wants to know how you keep your work streams organized. When you wake up in the morning, there must be a million things to do and think about. And how do you decide what to do first? That's a question from Chris. I am probably not a very good example of that. And I shouldn't be sharing how I do it because then, but I usually do first what I like the most. And you should not feel bad about it. And, and, and sometimes can be um, going to the kitchen and working on a new dish for mini bar because I want, I'm not happy with two star Michelin, I want to have three. Other time can be going to Congress and talking about why having no child hungry in America is the right thing to do. And I'm very passionate about that too. And I have the opportunity to do it. Sometimes it can be waking up in the morning and grabbing one of the books I never have time to read anymore. Um, I love to read all books. I have a, con a connection with all books that I cannot explain. I understand why people pay so much for all books. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you pay money for an old book when you can have the same thing in a new book and cheaper? And if you don't want to pay, you go to the library you don't have to pay a dime. Um, I love to read old books. Um, my favorite, Appert. I own a first edition. The guy that invented canning, Napoleon Bonaparte, will give uh, 10,000 gold francs to anybody who will come with a way to feed the troops at the battlefield. And this guy in 1809, even the book was published in 1810, came, came up with how to can vegetables, meats, and fish. Without canning, I don't know how we will survive the last 200 years. Canning to me is one of the most consequential things in recent memory of human invention. And, there, and still we don't give it any importance. But to me it's very important. So, so in, the, in, in the day, things of the day, we face a big problem right now. If it's no email, it's FaceTime. If not, somebody called you and you didn't answer because you were in the morning and you didn't do makeup, why didn't shave and I didn't want to answer, uh, or is text message, or is WhatsApp, or is the red message on Twitter, or is a message on Instagram of somebody cannot find me, and please, I need to, oh my God, what's happening? In the old days, we will, you know, we will receive a letter, maybe a, a phone call and that's it. And you'll only answer if you were next to the phone. And now it's becoming really, I would say overwhelming. So me, I try to use, use enjoy it. Um, when something is really important, somebody is gonna call you back again and he's gonna email you three times until you answer. When it's not really important, doesn't happen. But me, I do the things that really touch my heart first, and if it's something that doesn't touch my heart, but I need to be smart, I have people around me that tell me, hey, or you do this now, or we shut down your restaurant. <laughs> but me, I try used to enjoy it. I, I'm not gonna lie to you, I'm very selfish on that end. But I think selfishness in these things are good because at the end, what do you give priority to? You realize that everything is priority. But then what happened with your family and your wife and your daughters and your friends? they are no priority anymore. So I, I do believe this is going to make us think a lot. I've been enjoying my family like I've not enjoyed 25 years. Mm -hmm. In the moment that I don't know if I'm going to reopen my restaurants. <laughs> In the moment that, you know, I'm, we are looking at every dollar we spend. Even I have a good life, but listen, I need to work for a living. I know it's people in more dire situation than probably me, but, but now we're not spending so much anymore. We are. And actually, uh, I look at the for future with hope, but uncertainty. But these moments I'm spending with my family right now, money cannot buy that. So I keep going back to, people may say, Jose, you're highly disorganized. You say, no, I have the perfect organization. I do first the things that made me happy. 
because if I'm happy, I'm productive. And if I'm productive, I can help everybody much better. If I do the things that make me miserable, why, why I'm in this life for? So that's the most important. Do the things that make you really happy. Because the ones that make you happy, actually, you shouldn't be doing them in the first place. <laughs> so that's what I try to do. Yeah, and it seems like Fortunately, it's actually- way too many things that make me happy. <laughs> uh, but but that's the, I, I'm I, I'm telling you I think this is a good way to do it. If it's, you have way too many things that make you unhappy, man, you should quit and you should drop them immediately and just be happy. And so, what I do first, the things that make me happy. If they make me happy, I'm answering you before you even email me. <laughs> yeah. I think that's it. Yeah, it's an especially important message right now where there's plenty of things to, to feel uh, not so happy about. So might as well use the time we do have about the words, things we love. Um, so to get into a little bit more of the work itself, um, we have some questions about um, food waste and hunger from the audience, obviously both very relevant to your work. So from Harlow, he's wondering what leverage points there are in food waste in the context of the pandemic, especially with recent warnings from the UN about an impending global hunger crisis. Um, and then from Linda, how can we drive an ecosystem that incentivizes farmers and producers to redirect excess you know, produce dairy? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, we mentioned before distribution. Um, in Spain, in moments that Nobody was picking up oranges in a moment that was famine in North of Africa. And nobody was picking up oranges because the labor of picking the oranges was higher than the price of the oranges in the market. All right. But at the same time, we had hunger in parts of Northern Africa. How is that possible? And then we have UN through the World Food Program sending food from other parts of the world to these places in Africa so they can eat, shipping huge quantities of grain and et cetera from faraway places when across the Mediterranean you had extra leftover food getting rotten on the trees. Um, that the world is able to produce to this day enough food to feed the world is now. Food waste, we need only to understand it in a context, right? Um, it's almost like we need to be doing how many calories, or even better, because calories are becoming a thing that is not the best way to know what we produce, but we should be saying how many nutrients, quality nutrients and quality calories we are able to produce. And some people will argue with me that a calorie is a calorie and that's it. But quality nutrients, or quality calories with nutrients. And, and probably the number is gonna be staggering that we produce many times more than the entire planet needs. But still we have hunger in many parts of the world. And sometimes we refer to Africa and Latin America and Asia, which actually there are countries that export vegetables and fruits and to, to the rich countries, but still they have hunger. This is amazing, right? But still, we talk about Africa and South America, but then in our own cities, uh, near the universities, we teach our students, we have huge quantities of pockets of food insecure families. And at the end, it's a fairly simple equation. I do believe we have a system that is created politically to invest, to throw money at the problem. What that means? Let's make sure that we all have one that can afford it, health care, and let's make sure that we fix people once they get obese, overweight, high blood pressure, and when they are sick and they are about to be broken, let's spend large sums of money in the healthcare system to repair those broken men and women. When the system should be created to let's invest money to make sure that from early on, children are fed good vegetables, good fruits, good quality lifestyle. So in 
the later days of their life, that we don't have such expensive health care bill that then the system goes broken and then we say we cannot afford the healthcare system when actually we will be spending much less money investing into the solution, which is keeping our young children in America and in the world fed so they can be proper students, so they can receive proper education. And then we don't have the same problems we have at the end because it's a lot of interest created and more money, it seems, in fixing the broken bodies of humanity versus investing in healthy bodies to be net contributors to humanity. Until we are not able to solve that, in a crazy way, we will be having food waste going because there's not any willingness to make sure that food waste actually is something like, you cannot say it's forbidden, but actually it can be taxable, that you can be charging somebody for wasting food. Let me give you simple examples. I've been picking up okra in Florida. And supermarkets that want that okra, they only want this size. But guess what? Even the people, young people, you and I, people that believe like us, when we go to the supermarket, one thing is what we, when we have a shirt that say, don't food waste and, and, and ugly fruits are cool. But then all of us, we're part of the problem too. Because... We all want the best tomato and we all want the best eggplant. And still I am in the farmer's market and those ugly tomatoes that they sell you for 25 cents a pound, when I leave three hours later, they are still there and nobody's buying them. So we need to start putting pragmatism into the equation. One thing is what we believe and we say we support. And another thing is the actions of what really we support. I have a, I believe it's a disconnect. We all talk that tuna should be protected, but our sushi restaurants and fish restaurants are packed every single day. So how can you be being such a supportive community for protecting the oceans and tuna, but at the same time, <laughs> all those places are packed to the flag. I think it's a, a world food pragmatism that we're gonna have to start living by. So uh, the long story short, I do believe that um, political will is one of the ways to do it, but we cannot be expecting that politics alone will be the ones that fix everything. Requires to be a true economics of the people, that they believe that they will pay for agri fruits, that if I, want, if I get okra that is this big, I still will buy it reason the farmer throws it is because nobody buys the bigger okra. And so the, the guys that are paid by how many pieces of okra they pick every day, when the okra is bigger than this size, they throw it garbage. One mile away from where that okra is thrown down to the floor, you have hundreds of families that they don't know what they're gonna put on the table on that Sunday to feed their children. So we need to start thinking very locally to start fixing many of these problems because we are trying to have this global view, but sometimes even in the big producing areas of vegetables and fruits in America and in the world, nearby, we have huge pockets of hunger. And if we are not able to resolve the problems right in those small communities, where food production happens and hunger happens at the same time, if we are not able to solve the problems right there, we're gonna have a very hard time fixing any bigger problems. Used to, and I mentioned it before, why we have food deserts. Food deserts, they don't happen because it's not political will. We need in this case, political will to make sure that we say, if we have production of vegetables here and vegetables are going to the pile of compost, why we don't make sure that those vegetables, we have a way to subsidize or to give extra dollars to the farmer to make sure that actually the food will never be wasted, but that that food will be moved to those food deserts nearby to make sure that we bring joy to the community, that we bring what these communities need from us, which is not our pity, but our respect 
sometimes use making sure that this excess of food production in America gets to the places that have none is a way to show respect to every single individual. Thank you. Um, so now we have, a, first of all, I'll say there are a lot of positive messages of gratitude and inspiration coming into the chat box. I'll just read one from Paul Templeton says, listening and watching, watching you, Jose, I have more hope for a future than I've had before. Thank you, Jose, Alice, and all. I'm sure you're used to being inspiring to people, but um, yeah, people are really enjoying the talk. So um, we'll, we'll wrap up somewhat soon, but I wanted to um, finish off with a question that a couple people are asking, which is, how do you think we might come out of this pandemic in better shape in some ways? What are the silver linings or what would you hope to see? What would make you excited to come out of this kind of transformative um, time in history? Uh, I think, out of this, we, we are going to learn that we have to weaponize empathy. We need to weaponize the good things in life. I think we are realizing that the pizza delivery person that sometimes we didn't even look in the eyes when the person came and probably we didn't even leave enough tip. And now we realize they didn't even make enough money delivering your pizza that those guys right now, they are not used the pizza guy nobody remembers, but those are the men and women feeding many families across the world. We're gonna be realizing that the person that is working eight, nine, 10 hours in the supermarket, taking care of hundreds of families shopping, all of a sudden that person, that sometimes we didn't even care to look at their name tag and we barely ever thought about them. All of a sudden, those men and women are putting themselves and probably their families at risk only by the simple gesture of being there for long hours, taking care of maintaining every single household in America with fruits and vegetables and food so to keep feeding every single family. All of a sudden, we're going to be realizing that those people we took for granted that we didn't even care for are the men and women that keeps our system working. All of the time we're gonna realize that men and women in many of the very hard hit cities in the world, um, when you go to New York and you go Bronx, Queens, you go Corona, and you go to Bronx and you see that you have public housing and you have 20, 30, 40, 50 public housing that in some apartments of one studio or one bedroom apartment, you have eight, 10 people working because they cannot afford to live in the city. And that in the south of the city seems everybody is rich, but then in the north of the city, everybody seems is poor, but that actually this rich part of the city will not function with the poor part of the city. It's like, what are we doing wrong? I think we're gonna be learning about the amazing possibilities that our system have to take care of everybody, to take care of ourselves, but making sure that everybody is taken care of too. I do believe empathy, as I said at the beginning, is gonna be the big winner. I, we're gonna realize that who cares if you're Republican or Democrat anymore? This is touching everybody. What we should be caring is about respect for each other, learning from each other, taking care of each other, and I mean it sincerely. And that this is something like it's touching everybody. We saw Tom Hanks, he may be flying private, I don't know, but this can touch even people that we think are untouchable. Obviously the people that are suffering this the most are poor people, low income people, minorities. Uh, and we need to make sure that that doesn't happen again. Because if not, we are just moving into the wrong direction. Maybe we cannot fix the entire world, but the richest country in the history of mankind should be able to fix itself. If we want to be having any hope of trying to fix the many other parts of the world that maybe need improvement. But when I look at my own city, and I don't need to go anywhere else, and I see that across the river from the Potomac is Anacostia, where many parts in Anacostia, they barely have a supermarket three, four, five miles away near from where people live, you see that there's a lot of wrong things happening. So out of this, what is gonna come is a call to action. 
nobody, especially young people, can say, man, I don't know what to do with my life. The amazing thing is that every single person, especially if you are in business, you have every single opportunity to improve the systems, to create new systems, and to dream as crazy as you want. Because if it's a moment in your lifetime that you can be crazy and where every idea is possible, it's now. So I think this is what is gonna happen. Empathy is gonna blow away. Better understanding with people that don't even think like you is gonna be the new normal. Respecting each other are more important. Think crazy. Because now is the moment you used to think that anything is possible. And if somebody tells you you are crazy, boom, you're proving your point. Use big crazy and change the world because you have the opportunity to do it right now. Jose, thank you. We couldn't have asked for a more soulful and hopeful conversation tonight. Um, the vision of empathy blooming all over the planet at a time when we all need it most is very encouraging. And we're all very inspired by your, your presence. And also we're really grateful that in the midst of everything that's happening, you kept your commitment to our students at Berkeley. <laughs> If we'd had our um, normal Zoom, everybody, I'm sure would, you'd see everybody standing up like in the auditorium with a standing ovation. And I would even do that too, but I would be out of the frame. But no, it's I hope you feel it from us. Um, I feel it. Um, and uh, it's been a special and auspicious occasion to celebrate this with you and to be in your presence. And what we want to do now is because this is a special time and your family is right there, we want to give you back a few minutes of the evening. Fiona is going to share the um, link right now. Hopefully this will work on the webinar, webinar form of Zoom to right. take people into a, a, another room. But uh, I just want to say thank you and thank you. Um, best of luck to you with all of your endeavors. Thank Good evening. You. Yeah, Good thank evening. you. Take care. Be well.